Hello, friends, and welcome <laughs> and to new a, friends <laughs> and, and new friends, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Cinemondo Podcast. The three. Wait a minute, not the three of us. There's four of us. <laughs> we have a guest. We have a guest. Hi, I'm guest. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, our special guest today is a, I call him a true renaissance man. He's a screenwriter of such films <laughs> mm -hmm. as The Darkest Hour, Dante's Peak, The Alamo, and Daylight. He's also the series creator of Steven Spielberg's Taken from back in 2002. He's also written for the show Extent. Uh, on the music side, he was bassist in the 80s for uh, Sparks. Uh, you can see him in the Sparks Brothers documentary by Edgar Wright, and you should see it. I saw it at the theater. It was great. Uh, he was also in the band The Gleaming Spires. Les Boheme is, where our, is our here today. How are you, Les? Yay. I'm fine. That would be not be Renaissance man. That would be Jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those people. <laughs> uh, so, so the Sparks Brothers documentary kind of put them right back in the spotlight again. How do you feel about that? Oh, I mean, it's the, there's the, the documentary, and they wrote a, f a movie. They also did the music for that Adam Driver's in. That, that was the opening night movie at Con this year. Love it. So proving that there are in fact fifth acts in American life. I mean, yeah, <laughs> sure. Wow. It's, I mean, it's they're, inspiring. They're yeah. they're gifted. They 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 mm -hmm. they keep getting better. Um, yeah, yeah. They're they're they're. I mean, it's just it's fantastic that that happened. It really is. Is that the impression you had of them when you were working with them? That that they were great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was a fan of the band. Oh, my, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's propped on a book. That's Filmmakers, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, 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 and it's weird. I feel like I'm doing this, and I got it. Um, I was a fan of the band, yeah. and then we became friends, and. I actually asked them to produce my band, and instead they poached my band, and we wound up playing. <laughs> um, and, and we've been friends ever since. They're they're great, and they're brilliant, and and nobody has a career like that ever. Yeah, it's just it's yeah. stunning. From the moment they started, nobody had a career like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they would stand out. I think the best thing I, that's a spoiler on the documentary, but I think the best thing in the whole documentary is Flea going. Um, people just don't know how to take a sense of humor seriously. I right. Mean, that is oh, that's, that's profound. But yeah. That yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's far away the best thing in the documentary. Oh, oh, I thought you were that's great. In the documentary, I just like, you know. No, I, I think it's a really, I, I saw it at the theater, it was really fun. My wife is a huge Sparks fan, so anyway, we saw it, and we thought it was, um, what you had to say was great, and just it, the, the chronology is just fascinating. You know, It's amazing. I mean, it, it, and then when you start to think of everybody, I mean, I know it's the, the tagline of the movie is, you know, your favorite band's favorite band. But when you start to like, yeah. think like the, especially the eighties bands that I kind of don't like that I mostly blame David Bowie for. <laughs> I mean, I even blame Sparks for them. Too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Name those bands. I want to know what you're talking about. Yeah. You, you, you know, Human Haircut League, or oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah those. No, we, we know all those. Bands. <laughs> We know all of those. <laughs> I was um, I was in Catalina last week, and um, there's a Depeche Mode tribute band playing there. And I was like, I don't think I can name three songs. Like, how do you do an entire? I'm sorry, to respect to Depeche Mode. I'm sure they have some great songs. But, uh, like, how, how are you with Depeche? Like an '80s tribute band, maybe, but a Depeche Mode tribute band, exclusively De Depeche Mode only. What's uh, the? I don't even know what the haircut is. I mean, if you were Flock of Eagles. Like, yeah, that's yeah. true. I guess they just wear a lot of black, and um, and that's it. I, I would consider I would consider that on uh, you know unwatchable or unlistenable band because it was just I couldn't stand them back then in the eighties, and watching a tribute band would be even tougher. But that's just me in Depeche Mode. Wow. Yeah, I, 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 I feel like I didn't like them, but I, I don't remember. I I actually sort of like Depeche See, Mode. I like them. That's the thing. It's hard to hard to I say. Yeah. I mean, it's there like it's the song I, I that God has a, in my pocket where I can. <laughs> God really. God has a sixth sense of humor song. I don't. I'm, I don't, I'm not very good at titles, but I didn't but. really like them all that much back then. But at, <laughs> in recent years, it's sort of like the Cure. I sort of discovered the. I mean, I like the Cure and all, but yeah. then I discovered them later, and I was like, oh, this isn't too bad. And well, you. And, I mean, you find out what you know. A a lot a lot of those. Obviously, they're you know every everybody's pretty good. A lot of yeah. them had roots you didn't know about, right? 
And then a lot of them went on to do great stuff and you didn't realize it was them. So yeah, that's true. I always like Gary Newman and like real, yeah, that was a, he, he kind of launched a a lot of ships as well. I think, (laughs) well, craft work launched them all, I think, but, um, yeah. What what, what about suicide? They're, they're responsible for the, the the most obscure band responsible for all (laughs) that. That that is the era of, of, uh, music that was when new, you know, when new wave wasn't a bad word yet. And it was still that weird, almost touching together of music and performance art. Yeah. And yeah. you could go to an art gallery and see a band, you know, and, well, and artists I mean, were in bands and bands were artists. And yeah, I mean, that, well, you know, that, I mean, talking hats, you know, for yeah, us, sure. art school bands. Yeah. Well, what's, that, seen, that really good, what's the, the really good Brian Nino quote? 200 people bought the Velvet Underground, but they all formed bands. Yeah. <laughs> It's like oh those, those that footage of the first Sex Pistols show, and they 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 pan the audience with the camera, <laughs> and it's like, oh, there's Susie Sue, and there's the Clash, and there's Generation yeah, X, oh, and there's oh, Billy yeah. Idol, there's you know, it's like everybody in the audience went on That's to start really a band, funny. yeah, <laughs> oh my like God. all of the Buzzcocks in the front row. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, what was it like, like touring with a band like the Sparks? Oh, it's just really, really fun. I mean, it's you know, so we did one. That was the day when it was fun too. It yeah. was super. I mean, I have to say, when I joined the band, I remember Russell saying to me, "Oh God, if you'd only been in the band two years ago, like you know, this happened and this happened, you know." And then <laughs> when I finally started writing, I went to a party and everybody was like, "Oh man, if you'd been in a Hollywood party like two years ago." <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, uh, a day, you know, day late, but um, it was really fun. I mean, for one thing, just, you know, it's, you're, it's licensed to be a teenager till, till you stop doing it. You know, someone makes you mad every day. Someone feeds you. Um, yeah. And, um, we did like, we did a club tour that was really fun. We did some European tours and then we did a stadium tour opening for Rick Springfield. And, you know, so I got to play like, you know, metal and stuff like that. So it was incredible. That is yeah. amazing. It was really Amps. <laughs> It was, it was nothing but fun. That's right. And, you know, if we, in, when you're in somebody else's band, you're not, you know, you're never going to be, you know, artistically completely fulfilled. I mean, I was mm-hmm. playing, you know, bass to songs I love, but they weren't songs I wrote. But when problems occur, you know, like there was a point on the Springfield tour when um, the the single, I guess it was, I predict, had, had gone as high as it was going to go and... Uh, record company support was disappearing and we went from a tour bus to driving ourselves in a van oh, no. and we had a day off and we all went to see spinal tap and no one laughed we were just like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but so i mean you know those true. were those were problems ron and Ru- that hurt ron and russell in a way they couldn't possibly hurt me i was just like yeah that sucks but uh, oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, man so do you why did you decide to move from music to filmmaking and movies i i I, I'm probably, I don't, I've, I've told this story several times. So not to us. Just, uh, <laughs> just, uh, oh, um, I, my, my, my parents were both screenwriters, right? Mm-hmm. but they were, my mother hated it, went back to school, became a special collections librarian and a rare book dealer. <laughs> my father was a bit older and he was out of the business and he hated it and he had never social. I mean, my father wrote from silent movies until 1970. As wow. a great career, but he always wanted to be a novelist. My father once said that being a screenwriter was to real writing, like washing dishes, was to being a fine chef. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So you know, nepotism did nothing for me. Like, like <laughs> I, my first, script, my dad produced the TV show Rawhide. So oh, my yeah. first script, I wrote Dirty Harry three. There had only been two Dirty Harrys at that point. Figuring, well, my dad could just call Clint Eastman. He was, and my dad was like, I haven't spoken to him since. <laughs> Like, well, what do I do? He goes, get an agent. I'm like, yeah. well, how do I get an agent? He goes, well, don't sign with William Morris. That's all I can tell you. So, oh, like, the one thing nepotism did for me was I thought what grownups did when they went to work was they went in the other room and typed. Right. Oh, uh, I had, I had, you know, I'd, I'd written about a bunch of short stories. I'd just written that one script, I think, maybe two. And I, I had no, it wasn't anything I wanted to do particularly. I mean, I loved the movies. I was, you know, obsessed with movies, but I hadn't really thought about it. And I was playing in the band and my wife, then girlfriend, was working at the Los Feliz Theater and I was visiting her at work 
And this guy who had been the drummer in my band in high school, actually we were friends in high school, he was my, the drummer in, in a band I was in in college came in. Uh, his name's Stuart Kornfeld. And Stuart had just left the AFI and was producing for Mel Brooks. He wound up producing The Elephant Man and The Fly and wow. other movies. And Stuart is incredible. And so we decided we'd write something together. And we did. And then uh, I joined Sparks and I was doing it. TV show with us. I'm going to go into way too much detail, but we want detail. No, no, the podcast. It's, it's <laughs> a TV show with them in Paris, and I it was a, like a, one of those fake shows you just pretend to play. And I was in England trying to get Gleaming Spires a record deal, so I went to, to Paris to pretend to be playing bass. And um, I remember that that I, I I I was working really hard on my French and I came back to the shitty hotel I was staying in and someone had broken in and stolen my passport and my wallet. Oh, and I went downstairs to tell the guy at the desk and I was like, Kelcon uh I forget to say steal now, but you know, <laughs> yeah. ma, ma, BA. I was like, you know, so I was like so proud of myself that I had said someone stole my wallet in French that I didn't even care that it got ripped off. <laughs> and that night I got a call from Stuart. And Stuart said I just had a meeting with Atlantic Records and The Lad Company, which was a company that made movies then. And um, they're the uh, head of Atlantic Records. And Doug Morris. Doug Morris has an idea for a movie. And I told him that it's about rock and roll. And I said, you're in a band and you speak in complete sentences. And they'll fly, <laughs> you, they'll fly you back from Paris to talk to you about the movie. And I had just shaved my head for the Gleaming Spires video for how to get girls through hypnotism. So I look <laughs> creepier than I really am. Hopefully. Actually, I kind of look like I do now, but <laughs> there was, there was, you know, a choice. <laughs> and um, I, I, they flew me back and I was jet lagged. There were probably drugs involved and <laughs> there were definitely drugs. <laughs> There's <was> probably. <laughs> and they told me the idea and I said, that's idiotic. Rock and roll is nothing like that. Can you take send me back to Paris? And they hired me on the spot. And it's like, I, I'd seen that happen in my failed rock and roll career. I see it happen to this day in the movies. You know, it, it's high school dating. And if you act like you don't want to go out with somebody, they want to go out with you. I've never been able to recreate that. Anytime I try to be a people go, he's, he's difficult. And that, that's oh. it. Yeah, that one worked and they hired me. Um, I I wrote the script. I got an agent. Um, Stuart got me my next two jobs. I got yeah. Spark signed to Atlantic Records. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. I mean, you know, and I was pissed the whole time because I was like, I was in this room with people who had never listened to my own band's demo tape. So, yeah. I, right. I was, I oh yeah. Um, yeah. And that got me like four years worth of. A f I, I wrote another script for Stewart. I wrote a script for Amy Heckerling. I wrote a script for Warner Brothers. And they were all about rock and roll. And <laughs> so that meant like the young executive who thought it was cool because I was in bands that were semi-popular uh, thought it was a great idea to hire me. I was cheap. And then their bosses, this is early 80s, so their bosses would look at the scripts and go, well, Mel Gibson's not playing a rock star. Kevin Costner's not playing a rock star. And the scripts would never get made. And <laughs> So I was writing the whole time I was in Sparks, and then there there came a point where I had gotten hired to write a treatment, which was already like beneath me, but it was this Nick Pelleggi article about uh, the, the cops who caught the rapists of the nun in Harlem. And they put me up in New York, and I wrote the treatment, and Al Pacino wanted to do it. And it was in that period when Al Pacino wasn't in movies, like right. maybe yeah. pre-scent of a woman and before right. the, the mm -hmm. 70s run. I mean, after the 70s run. And so they they wanted me to stay in New York to write the script. And so I called Ron, Ron and Russell to quit the band. And they were really relieved because they had been having to pay to fly me back and forth a lot. And Ron was playing most of the bass parts on the synth now. And they were kind of looking to start the next thing they were going to do. So it was a very amicable you know, you can't fire me. I quit. And <laughs> I had this one meeting with, I am really taking a long time on this. I'm sorry about it. We no, love I, it. This is fascinating. Asked. I love it. No, no. <laughs> keep so going. I have this, I have one lunch with Al Pacino and he's very, very nice. And he gives me his home number and he says, you know, you can call me anytime you have any problem. I'm excited about this. 
I, I about halfway through writing the script in a hotel room in New York, and you know, and doing all the things real screenwriters get to do, like go on drive-alongs with cops, you know, and, and yeah. I mean, this is the first time I've had a relationship with a policeman that wasn't, please don't find my stash, you know, so yeah. um, <laughs> and I, I think I should call out, you know, this is like, I got a relationship here. So I call this number and somebody answers and goes, who is this? And I say, Les Bohemian. So, okay, I'll call you back. Uh, about three days later, I call the same number and it's been changed. <laughs> I, I turn in the first draft of the script. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, you know, the way these deals, at least, I mean, now they're more one-step deals. But in those days, a deal was usually what they called a three-step deal, which meant you write a draft, they give you their notes, you write another draft. Then there's this thing called a polish, which is the same or more amount of work for less money. And then you're done. And so I turned in this first draft. They paid me out, meaning we hate this script so much, we don't even want to bother having you rewrite Oh, my God. And, uh, I went, I came back home and that's <laughs> probably 35, 30, yeah, 34, 35. And I came back home and Sparks was playing at a club called the Palace in Hollywood. And I went to see them and they had this new bass player and he was like 50 pounds skinnier than me. He had <laughs> this perfect flock of haircut 100, you know, oh, no. perfect. Like you could toss it, you know, and it, it would, it would knocking the wings and he played like, he played like way way better than i ever played oh, I mean, no. he was like a, a quality musician i was just a a, a failed guitar player oh <laughs> and, and so i was like i say what's the matter it's like wow that, that's that's both my careers gone wow that's oh like a God. double whammy it was a double whammy it was a bad six months <laughs> al pacino changes his number the studio buys you out and they replace you in the band that's a bad day and, and, and that's the story of how I wound up right. So how I stopped playing music and wound up right. <laughs> because it was such a great experience. You needed more of that. I did, well, <laughs> yeah. I, the only other jobs that rock guys could get were horror movies because, mm -hmm. you know, that's sort of like metal monster tie in or something. Right. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I got that through my, my agent that was, was terrific. And I, I, I got to be friends with Sean Cunningham and, Mm -hmm. I did a bunch of rewrites for him on there, there's one. I, I, if I say this out loud, I could probably get thrown out of the guild, but there's one Friday, the 13th movie. It's the one after Jason takes Manhattan. Which Can by we way, say it and not get the, thrown out? The, the single best trailer in, in the history of the movies was Jason takes Manhattan, just <laughs> yes. the, the subway and, and <laughs> Jason coming out in full ski mask. I mean, as like, the, but um, I did some rewrites on one of the Friday the 13th movies and I didn't do enough to get credit. And, mm. and in the weird machinations of, of the way credit works, <clears throat> the only person who works on a movie whose name doesn't appear on the movie anywhere is an uncredited writer, right? Uh, okay. I, I like, like, absolutely. I mean, you know, like they, they, they list everybody who works on a movie. They don't, they've, they've never found a way to list the uncredited writers. So what is the well, limit for an uncredited writer? Like what's uh, the, enough and what's not enough? Very, it's, a, it's a complicated threshold of okay. arbitration with the game. Yeah. There's more than two. Oh, okay. I don't know all the rules. I think if it's more right. than two writers or one of the writers is a, a musician. <laughs> well, he is, is a director or producer. <laughs> the, the, but it, theoretically you have to change more than a third of okay. plot, character, and dialogue. It's And Interesting. Uh, three writers read the scripts and decide, and we all fight very hard, even though we know we don't deserve it or we're sure we deserve it because your money is determined. But uh, you're yeah. there. you only get residuals if you get credit. And right, right. It's, oh. it's a pet peeve of most writers that yeah. they should find another. Like basically, what they should do is they should have to pay all of us yes the residuals regardless and of that course. Works. Absolutely. This storage needs this rewriting, blah, blah, blah. But anyway. You all worked on it. <laughs> I'm, I'm credited on one of those uh, Friday the 13th as executive typist. <laughs> and, uh, which was nice. <laughs> A new and, skill you can put on your resume. Yeah. Um, and then out of that, uh, he hired me to write um, the third house movie, to rewrite the third house movie, which house two then flopped. So it's called The Horror Show. And that was my oh. first credit. Uh, and then oh. that, that I, I, I had... I, I, I hear you guys talking about Rosemary's Baby a lot. I had, <laughs> I had pitched earlier in my, for want of a better word, career, um, 
for the, I, I was pitching for the third Nightmare on Elm Street. And uh, I suggested Freddie has a baby, but I said, well, what I said was, why don't we rip off Rosemary's baby? And <laughs> okay, I was, I you? was pitching to a woman who was eight months pregnant. And when I said, mm -hmm. and you could see the little claws trying to claw their way out. I, <laughs> I lost the job. Oh, <laughs> and then they, they, they called me after I'd done the horror show and we're like, well, we have this idea for nightmare five, Freddie has a baby. And I was like, <laughs> Check your notes. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. like it wasn't even, you know, first of all, they called me. So I, there's no complaint there, but also it's like, true. you know, like, what did they rip off? Me saying, let's rip off Rosemary's baby. Yeah. <laughs> they ripped off your rip off. <laughs> oh, then, I mean, so in the, in the tangled history of my career, I, I, I moved from rock, rock movies to horror movies because that was the. That's funny. Move. That's really funny. And I then you, awesome. you moved on to Spielberg. Well, we'll get there. <laughs> but then you did a Pierce Brosnan film. I well, in that, you you way, definitely way. made a big leap there somehow. So how did you do that? It, I had it. I after the Nightmare movie, I did a bunch of. I don't remember the order of stuff, but you know, you, you had to, I wrote a bunch of movies that never got made. I did some rewrites on a couple of Jean Claude Van Damme movies. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I saved Rose I saved Rosanna Arquette from being gang raped once because it was a Joe yeah. Esther, it was a Joe Esterhouse script and the gang rape it's a really disgusting scene that later showed up in um, mm. what's the what's the Vegas showgirls showgirls yeah. wow um, really oh yeah wow. and, and they had told him that it was a PG-13 movie and they wished you would tone it down how how much can I swear on your show <laughs> where well, it's a podcast you can say whatever yeah. you want yeah he, um, he 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 did, he took seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and toned toned down the script by changing one line. He changed the line. We're gonna fuck you, cunt. To we're gonna show you a good time, honey. And That's very different it. messaging. <laughs> <laughs> so they they I mean wow. I hate being on the side of the studio over the writer, but they fired him. Man, like a, so that was one of my jobs. Anyway, <laughs> um, we had bought our first house and we had we were in the midst. Yeah, you know, I had, I hadn't worked in like six months and. You know, is that like middle class poverty? You know, like like right. every every fancy appliance we bought was breaking, and <laughs> the mortgage was due, and you know, blah blah blah. I mean, it was like, like there was nothing tragic about this, but it would have meant you know uh. a, a little a little less, a lot less. <laughs> and um, you know, and and my my guys who helped me out in business were like, I was like, what do I do? And they're like, punt. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and, um, which since I don't follow football, it took me a while to understand what that means. <laughs> I was say, what does that mean? Is that baseball? What is that? Um, and I was having lunch with this new producer who who was very aggressive. And um, I was in a bad mood and he said, everyone in town knows that you're a really good writer. Everybody talks about what a good writer you are. And by the way, if you ever hear the writing's really good, that's can we just be friends? You know, it's, just, just, oh, yeah. no. it's over. It's, like, it's, it's not me. It's not you. It's, it's me. me. Yeah. Well, um, it's like he's got an interesting hey. face. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was it? All the money's on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was, I was, I was, you know, I was, I was, I was listening to that. He said, but you don't think commercially. And mm. so I was just pissed. So I was being really bitchy and I went, well, yeah, I, I, I like commercial movies. I like disaster movies. I think Towering Inferno had just been on TV. It's like, I love disaster movies. I'm going to trap 45 people in the Holland Tunnel on the hottest day of the year. Love and we both, uh, like, we both got like eerily quiet because you don't, you know, you know, tell it to me in a sentence is supposed to be the, the yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was Stuart, the guy I was talking about, Stuart Kornfeld, who first explained that to me. It was um, Escape from New York had not yet come out. And he said, this is how to pitch a movie. In 1997, New York is declared a penal colony. In 2000, the president's plane goes down in New York. And I was like, yeah, yeah I've never heard anything better in my life. I Amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, I've only had one of those ideas in my entire life, and that was the Holland Tunnel idea. And <laughs> so, I, really, I mean, I've, you know, like, like, because what follows is Dante's Peak, and that's like a volcano erupts. That's not one of those ideas. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I, I was like, can you, if you could send me to New York and get me into a tunnel, um, I'll, I'll write a script in six weeks. And so 
it was, this is pre nine 11. So, you know, they, they shut down the Brooklyn battery tunnel for me and I got to go inside and, you know, oh, I yeah. was really incredible. and I wrote the script that became daylight and, um, and I, you know, I, I like, it was, this is 95, somebody in 94, 95. So it was the height of the, the huge spec sales. And so, you know, I had like this adult conversation with myself, which was <laughs> you, you know, you can't keep saying these people are so dumb because if they're that dumb, why don't you have more of their money? <laughs> and that's a very adult conversation. It was. I was like, read these scripts and play by the rules. You know, so I read 20 of the scripts that had sold for over a million dollars at that point. You know, and like that's Shane Black scripts and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. So I set out to write Daylight. And in my draft of Daylight, um, there are a couple, these two gay hitmen, and they're following their quarry into the tunnel. And when the tunnel collapses, uh, the guy, w one of the two hitmen is trapped in the rubble. And the guy they were going to kill helps his, it was then boyfriend, because there was no gay marriage, <laughs> helps his boyfriend <laughs> to pull him out of the rubble. Which I thought was, yeah, yeah, it was just like, I could not help, but like that, that was not going to be in a 1995. So right. was long, you know? I mean, it was, it was cool. I thought. Very cool. <laughs> so I, I, I had no, no, no ability to play by the rules, but the idea was writer proof. And so they bought it. And the first question they asked was, who do we get to rewrite it? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I mean, literally. I, I, literally. Like, like the day, you know, there was a bidding war to buy it. They bought it that, that day. They asked who would rewrite it. Uh, and <laughs> the producer went on to, um, you know, he just kept calling me and saying, uh, now you need to write a volcano movie. Uh, <laughs> okay. I said, you know, who am I, Sterling Siliphant? You know, like, yeah. <laughs> are you for an and earthquake? I can't do that. It's amazing. <laughs> um, and he just wouldn't leave me alone. So I did. And that was Dante's uh, Peak. That was, uh, that was crazy. That was, that, that was a good couple of years as opposed to the, he plays bass better than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like, I mean, you don't hear much about the screenwriting side of the business and it sounds brutal. Um, Is it? I mean, it sounds like a very disposable way they treat copy like screenwriting. Well, sure, sure. And everybody likes to say that, but I, I, I think it's, I, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Okay. I mean, for one thing, we're paid better than any other True. kind of writer, unless you're Stephen King or Nicholas Sparks, you know, but, but, sure. Um, I mean, by a crazy proportion to what, you, yeah. you know, like a, a, a novelist can't, writing great work can't support themselves. You know, right, so right. there's, um, do you guys remember a J Ward cartoon called Super Chicken? Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I do. Yes. Uh, well, the I might even song, have them all on DVD. <laughs> the well, the theme song, which is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you're afraid, you'll have to overlook it. Besides, you knew the job was dangerous when you took it. Yeah, um, oh, that's nice. like you know, it, and, and <laughs> yeah, there's a very. I mean, I think there 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 are many reasons why uh, writers are kind of easily replaced. Um, one is simply the 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 way the movies are made. The writer's not there when the movie's made. So yeah. everybody else making the movie kind of forgets this person who's not there. They don't, they, they, they barely think about right. writers. They barely think about editors who are, you know, the most important part of the whole process. Right. I mean, I've seen editors say really, really oh, bad yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. sure. But, you know, they're not there for all the camaraderie and, and yeah. You know, the family the stuff. There's, I mean, it's, so that there's just a, yeah. a, an absolutely accidental byproduct of, you know, of that. And then, there's also, I mean, I, I, I've, I've been in this situation because I've been the middle relief writer on a lot of stuff. And basically, if I have no investment whatsoever and I'm just doing my craft, it's a lot easier for the producer to, to ruin or make the script better without offending the original writer. Right. So it, as just a, a trip to the office on a Thursday, it's easier to tell somebody who doesn't give a shit that you want to do this or that than to tell somebody who's got their heart and soul in something. So yeah. sadly, that's why so much stuff gets that homogenized because it just gets to the point where no one wants to fight anymore and they find somebody who won't fight. Yeah. And then, 
like it's it's a scary amount of money and everybody want it, the the basic premise is if you you want to keep your job as, as anybody in, in the food chain assume failure and figure out how you're not going down with the ship right and so there's a lot of stuff <laughs> in your ass like yeah if if you well on daylight uh this is a casting example but uh, Nicholas Cage was pre The Rock and and pre leaving Las Vegas, and he wanted to do it, and he wanted a million dollars. And the guy running Universal said, "I I I, I won't do that. I'll, I'll pay Stallone twenty. And they went out and got him. And the fa- the movie did not do well at all in in the United States. It did well abroad, but the executive didn't get fired. If it had failed with Nicholas Cage, he would have gotten fired." So he was assuming failure and covering his ass. Another way to cover your ass is, well, I hired an Academy Award winning writer (laughs) to (laughs) dialogue. So clearly it's not my fault anymore. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, and and I I saved this one for last because I don't think we we writers as a group ever acknowledge the blame. (laughs) Um, (laughs) the, The writers who started Hollywood, you know, I mean, pre-Guild were, uh, you know, there, there were uh, oddly a, a lot of women, silent movies, a lot of women, um, mostly society women, you know, Pasadena money and they dabbled in writing. Um, yeah. But you've got, you know, Anita Luce, Frances Marion, you've got like, like incredible women doing that. And then you've got like sort of like gamblers, you know, racetrack guys who are friends of Jack Warner's and, you know, like, right. like, like they're like 30 guys who all made up something on a story or, you know, his drinking buddy. And then you've got the prestige guys, the playwrights and the novelists. And mm. they're starting to sort of put together the what will become the Writers Guild, you know, but they're starting to put together like a basis for how they're going to do this. The, the novelists, well, I go back to what my father said about, you know, it's, it's dishwashing. They were so dismissive of the work that we're the only right we're, we're the best paid group of writers, but we're also the only writers who give away our copyright. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So collectively as a group, we have a very low opinion of ourselves. <laughs> it, it, it's hard to find a writer who doesn't either want to write a novel or think they should direct. You know, they think it's like true. My friend Howard Rodman said it's it's the the dish, the um, the waitressing job on your way to being a director. Right. Uh, yeah. It's like, like, you know, and that, so part of it's like, we bring it on ourselves by just kind of not, you know, and then, and then it's, it's so institutionalized at this point that, mm-hmm. you know, that it just, it is what it is. But no, is it, is it, is it awful? No, I mean, I'm a, I'm a grown man and I make my living making shit up like that. That's, yeah. that's <laughs> <laughs> no, it's yeah. awesome. But there, also it has, no that, about that. it has that element of like, you know, we all kind of have our jobs within kind of the industry. Yeah. And a lot of it is other people people making decisions on your creative work and they're yeah, not creative always. and they're making the decisions always. Yeah. And that's just a different it's I think it's uh, one of those angles that's hard for people to really understand unless they're like kind of creative or whatever, how it feels to have people making those decisions. But at the same yeah. time, like it's, you said, it's fun. It's like it pays you pretty well. You know, it's a, it's a pretty cool job working in this craziness. So I don't ever really lament that I'm in the business, yeah. but it, it can have its moments. <laughs> oh, yeah, but the thing is, you, I mean, you, I mean, I spend a great deal of my, you know, spare drinking and coffee time with other writers complaining, but it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, like you can only complain to, to I mean, yeah, you, you got to stop every once in a while, you know, like, like, um, again, <laughs> yeah. uh, tell another story of my friend Stuart. So my friend Stuart is work, he was producing for Mel Brooks. I think it was your show of shows. Uh, with, with the history of the world, mm. and so it was all those you, your show of shows writers, you know, right? right. Yeah, bunch of old Jews in the room, and, <laughs> yeah. and so they come out after a day in the writers' room. Stuart's standing there, and, and one of these guys says to, to Mel Brooks, oh, "Mel, that was that was really a hard, that was such hard work." And Mel Brooks goes, "Lifting, lifting is hard work." <laughs> 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 oh my God. Oh my God, like, yeah it's like i mean because oh. you know you could you you could have asked me a 
different question, like my experience on my last TV show for Hulu, and I would have been a cranky writer telling you that they never had a good note. And, you know, let's talk about that. <laughs> now, wait, what? Well, just not even you know. We don't have to name names or anything. But did, so you're a writer. Did you have aspirations to be director or showrunner or like? Is that something you you wanted, or is that just how it kind of evolved into a show? Well, I never like, I with never, streaming like that. I I never. I wish the shirt said, "What I never ever under any circumstances wanted yes. to do is direct." I, uh, exactly. uh, that. Um, I I'm confident that I'm pretty good at what I do, and. I've seen, a, you know, I, I think, so it's a two-part question. So <laughs> directing, I think, is is one of the easier jobs to be competent at and the hardest job to be brilliant at. Mm-hmm. You know, like there, you have enough people who know what they're doing who won't let you completely fail. You yeah. point the small right. end of the camera yeah. at, the, at the actor. Yeah. <laughs> we've all seen stuff that's really pretty good that's not particularly well-directed. Right. But right. when you see something that's, you know, when you see, Billy Wilder movie, or you know, or, or, yeah, or, mm-hmm. or, yeah. Uh, what about you know? We need to talk about Kevin. Like that. That's a movie that is so yes. perfectly yeah. directed. You know, like every single bit, of every frame. You know, you're just like, yeah. and I'm, you know, I'm arrogant enough to think, well, if I can't be that good, why would I ever do it? <laughs> I have yeah. to be brilliant, or I won't do it at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There's definitely sure, directors that have. Yeah. I've worked with who are who the DP is a better director than yeah, they oh, are, awesome. and yeah. the DP made the film. You know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or you know, it, I mean, in 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 television, you see people who are just like amazingly competent at at you know the craft. Yeah, you know, it's it's not about like they're not Scorsese, but they're like, wow, you staged that fight scene and did it in half a day and yeah. you know, it was like, <laughs> what you know like, i remember going to it was on the, the halle berry show extant and there was this incredibly elaborate fight scene with i, I always steal from red harvest so there was two sets of bad guys <laughs> and you know and the cops and i you know and the aliens i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember that, like, as I said, I have no aspiration to do it, but I just, I got there at five in the morning. And I was like, I'm going to sit here for an hour and see if I could figure out how to do this. And, you know, I was still sitting there when the director got there and I, I like, I didn't have a clue. And he, he just went, <laughs> and they were, they were out in, in two hours. And so, That's well, that is, that is craft on a level I can't even imagine. Right. Efficiency um, and craft. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And good stunt and then, coordinators. Yeah, well, it's funny you say the difference between competent and brilliant because, I think we're used to seeing competent entertainment. You know, most of it is. And then when you see something that just explodes, like you kind of, it's like, why isn't it all like this? Like I saw yeah. Gangs of London recently. Uh-huh. Why isn't all TV that good? Like their Have stuff was movie quality, like choreography, oh, yeah. action. Like how come we don't see action shows that have this level in it? It can be done, but you're like, well, it's that guy, you know? <laughs> Did you guys watch Jerry Haji? No. No. That's that's my favorite show of the pandemic. Because let's I'm, put it okay. Yeah, let's talk about this. Okay, unbel- I mean, just unbelievable. There's I. First of all, it's great from the get. It's funny. It's brilliantly made. It's it's exciting as could be. Characters are amazing. There there's a scene in the last episode that's the bravest thing I've ever seen anybody do on television. That's I, yeah. and I, I, oh, you, yeah. you have to watch the whole thing to get to that. But it's not like it's a chore to watch the whole thing. Things it's it was I it, I just loved it, and it was yeah it was absolutely like you could do that. Uh, Whoa! What was okay. it called again? What was it called? Jiri Haji. It's a Japanese British co-production. Oh Jiri okay. Haji. Okay. We'll look oh. at that. So that oh, that's one of your your let's talk about your list of, of bingeable TV. So that's yeah. one, Sherry Haji. My list. <laughs> <laughs> let's bring it out. Let's you see know, how I, much I, we've I, all seen. I like like the first couple of months of of um, of the modern world. Um, <laughs> the postmodern world. Yeah. Um, I, I was just like Criterion, and I'm gonna watch every. I'm gonna fill in every hole in my. First, I was going to go, I'm going to watch every Fassbender movie in order. And, Boy, that's a slog. Yeah. And, and I did. Yeah, but, it, but ultimately, good for you. Oh, no, it was, I mean, it was, I did, and it was fantastic. Yeah. And literally, the only downside was that there was a movie I remember from the 70s called Jailbait, and yeah. it's not available. And, you know, every once in a while, you could find a movie on YouTube that's nowhere else. 
you don't want to look up jailbait on YouTube. You want to right. look up oh, you know, God. Yeah. <laughs> Some things are unsearchable. <laughs> yeah, like, that, was a, that was a good one. Um, All of a sudden, like, knock on your door. Yeah. But I was like, like, I, have so, a, like I have a friend I, who I was, was with like, a. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, like, I, you know, I was like, I never did see Hiroshima Mono more. I guess I'll watch that. You know? <laughs> and Berlin <laughs> Alexander like, Platz. Berlin is going to be too hard. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> did you make it through Berlin, Berlin Alexander Platz? <laughs> oh, twice. Oh, yeah, wow. I, I actually would, like that one. The, oh, I, I think, I mean, I love it. I just think they're yeah. unbelievable. But, <laughs> World but I, on a Wire. Yeah. But I, 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 I had never seen Berlin Alexander play, so that's where I started. And then I was like, I'm going to watch them all because I, you know, I always wow. love them. So then I got all the way to the end. And I was like, because he has the stock company. I was like, I'm going to watch Berlin Alexander play again because now I know all these people. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. That, now you that, care. I used to have it on VHS oh, yeah. in the box. Ooh, yeah, that was a good box. <laughs> that was a good box. <laughs> I love that that show. It's um, the way it starts. The 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 uh, text on the screen as as uh, he's released from prison. The, the title is The Punishment Begins. Yeah. <laughs> He's getting out. <laughs> He's a cheerful man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's his awesome. life is more of a more of a story than his films, I think. <laughs> it's pretty much is. I mean, it's exactly yeah. like his movies. That's all I yeah. mean. And then all the sort of peripheral... Like, oh, I'm blanking on the guy's name. He's in a lot of the movies. He was married to Anna Karina. And then he directed like American splatter movies in the seventies, and some of them have like part of the Fassbender cast. Oh, oh and he's, wait, he's also he's he's the the lead in Peeping Tom. Oh, ah. yeah. Why don't I know his name? We all, yeah, again, if we only had this little device, is it on. Goddard? I mean, Goddard? Goddard? John no. Luke Goddard? No, no, oh, no. Goddard. I'm Rar. looking at. Hang on, I'm looking at. <laughs> We got right here. On, 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 Why you, you have some kind of a machine audience, that you can right? look things up with? <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? I love that you can just find it. You don't have to use your memory at all. Yeah, that's <laughs> why I don't know. Carl Heinz Bohm. How can I? His name is my last. What name. you didn't yeah. know that? <laughs> there it is. Yeah. That's, that's there you go. That's great. See, that's that's, that's that's really then, funny. Th- th- I would fall down these rabbit holes. To, so. The, I, maybe it was like for Halloween or something. Criterion has like obscure splatter movies. Yeah, oh, I love that. Oh God, what's this movie called? Let me see if I wrote it down. <laughs> I have did. to know about obscure splatter films because yes, I'm always I looking for them. Oh come on, I know I wrote this down. Hang on. <laughs> yes, I did. Deep Crimson. So Deep Crimson, mm-hmm. Profundo Carmesi. It's so it, it's a Mexican movie from I think the nineties. The little blurb said. Based on the same source material as the Honeymoon Killers. Oh, okay. so I start watching it, and it's absolutely brilliant. I'm like, this guy's really good. This is who's this director? And his name is his name is Arturo Ripstein. So I look up Arturo Ripstein. He was Boone Wells' AD on the Mexican movies. Whoa. He's made like fifty movies. The first one, wow. which is called, is a western called Time to Time to Die. It's written by Gabriel Marquez mm-hmm. and Carlos Fuentes. No kidding. And oh. I, I so, amazing recommendation. Well, there's maybe yeah. like, there's like six or seven of his movies that you can stream, and then I got another twelve on DVD, and oh, a lot. Of, I mean, he wound up like like he you know he, he, I think he still makes movies. He he made No One Writes to the Colonel. You know he has like like occasional forays into the international world, but I don't know why. I didn't know about him when I knew about any, you know, Godard or Boomwell or any of those guys. I mean, yeah. the, his movies are stunning. Mm. And then I I stumble on, you know, because because the rabbit holes are all there. <laughs> his son, yeah. Gabriel Ripstein, who I'm going to assume was named for Gabriel Marquez, and I just made that. So he made a movie called 600 Miles with Tim Roth. And then... He's done a lot of TV, and he, there's a one-season show called The Enemy Within, or The Unknown Enemy. And yeah. it's about the riots at the Mexico City Olympics. Fantastic. Just, it was oh. like, this is like, like absolutely stunning. So that, that was my, my wow. that and Quentin Depew. Those were my two recent. The guy that made Rubber and 
Gear Skin. Oh, oh, this yes, is like the you. best binge list yeah. I've ever heard because it's all <laughs> stuff I have not seen, and I am about yeah. to now have this huge plethora of stuff to watch. Now I love have that. You, yeah. Have you? Do you have fifty hours to watch Le Bureau, that French spy? I'm show gonna there? find it. <laughs> I <laughs> I hear Bureau about is, that. Yeah, Le Bureau is my other favorite thing. Le Bureau. Them. Okay, I'm definitely playing like about John that. Like worthy spy stuff. It's just incredible. Hero. The guy, I think his name is Eric Rochon. He's the yeah, writer, Eric Rochon, yeah. yeah, writer director. Yep. Of just, that, I mean, it, it's so good. It's like, like always looking for stuff. But that Bo Boonwell connection before, it's like that. He's one of my favorite. Exterminating Angel is one of my favorite yeah. movies. Hmm. That movie cool. just is. I I really look for films. I really value movies that can disorient me. Oh, yeah. watch the, the, these 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 Arturo Ripstein movies. Every one of them. Really? They're, they're you know deeply vested in that sort of magical realism yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but but then with the sort of more well right I not mean, just weird for weird sake or weird oh, no, not at all. or weirdness but genuinely disorienting in a in sort of a like a visceral way that you can't really put your finger on how it's disorienting you <laughs> like how does the how is this working like exterminating angel it's like what a weird idea why does it work so well <laughs> i love that that to me is like david lynch you know yeah and when we talked about like direction versus competent direction versus brilliant you know we have the twin peaks series and we had it all laid out it was all david lynch and they had different directors yeah the difference between a david lynch episode and everyone else's episodes just vast everyone was trying to be david lynch but they weren't even close so uh, I, mean, I always like seeing that, just that juxtaposition yeah. of good versus not as good. <laughs> it's really fast. I mean, it, 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 I mean, and sometimes you see, especially on TV, you see it where, you know, like, like the, the pilot director's vision was so strong that it mm -hmm. just like the competent people could now kind of, I know I, there was a, somewhere in my mid career, there was a, a script at Paramount called No Bail for the Judge. It was written by Samuel Taylor who wrote, uh, Sabrina and Vertigo oh, and mm. it, Alfred Hitchcock was supposed to direct it and I believe the gossip is Audrey Hepburn was pregnant with William Holden's baby and had an abortion and they shut down the movie oh my and gosh he so never, much with drama. and he never made the movie although he did use like two scenes from it in Frenzy but they were somebody was going to remake it and they sent me these two documents. And you know, a, a, a movie screenplay is 90 to 120 pages long. Right. They sent me, these, the two documents was this thing I've never seen that was 150 pages long that was every single shot, every single thing that would happen in the shot, but no dialogue. <laughs> and then there was a script that was maybe 210 pages long. And, if, and I could take that script and a camera and make an Alfred Hitchcock movie and you would think it was an Alfred Hitchcock movie. I mean, it was wow. like, no, you didn't. So you didn't, you know, the genius was already, he, he'd already done the genius part, you know, the rest That's of it was funny. like, work. so oh. I think, I think sometimes like, like you see a really strong thing like that, especially in television where then people can come up and, and kind of keep it going. Right. They have it like a, a blueprint of what they yeah. need to do. <laughs> I wonder if that's frustrating for them. They can bring their own creative thing to this. Well, I, I'm sure like being, you know, like an episodic, Getting paid. Director, an episodic director in TV is probably not the most rewarding director. Right. That's true. Like the first season of True Detective, um, they had the same same writer, same cinematographer. And at the end of it, they're like, never again. <laughs> never again will we all direct every episode. It's <laughs> like yeah, something no, no, no. Woo! Yeah, you need to rest. Well, like, you, you know, like you know, I ranked it all of Chernobyl, and that's pretty consistently great. So. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh, it's pretty yeah. grim. But. Yeah. Dark. <laughs> oh, and is so that the end of your list? You so any more suggestions my for my friend. list? Let's yeah. take a look. At, well, let's see what's on the list. Can we stop for a minute for the? To, have you seen any of those Quentin Dupuis movies? Like, I like what? Rubber is about a homicidal truck tire. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I have uh, seen. Right. Uh, yes, I did. Deer I did that. Deer so is about a man who's in love with a, a fringe jacket. And, uh, <laughs> I just watched his, his new movie called Mandible, which is just, it's hilarious. These two guys find a giant fly. They steal a car and they find a fly like the size of the trunk in the trunk. <laughs> oh and they, they're really stupid. And 
they decide that they could maybe tame it and it could rob banks for them. <laughs> yeah, that's what you do when you find a giant fly. <laughs> the first thing I'm I think we can do with banks. <laughs> it's just like he's so great because it's like like that's uh, like, like I've watched a couple of his cop movies, which are equally bizarre and great, and it's awesome. like. They're everything great about theater of the absurd, but minus all of the pretension. You know, they're just <laughs> they're just weird and funny, and they're. I think, awesome. really good. I'm going to go directly to those after this. Me too. Uh, this sounds like, amazing. This is, you're you're going to have to cancel the podcast now for like six months. <laughs> yeah, be like, we're too busy. <laughs> sounds like my my kind of stuff. What we need okay, to do yeah. is we're going to watch them and then have you on again, and we'll talk just about that. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk <laughs> about Jerry? Well. I can talk about Jerry Hodge endlessly. <laughs> We're going to watch Jerry Hodge first. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, it's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> that I, sounds I amazing. Swear on if, if you love it. And no matter what, even if you hate it, which you won't, just keep watching. Because <laughs> that, that, that there, there's just some stuff that you should not keep be able watching. to watch. It's so good. Okay. Let's talk about your, your phone booth list. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. It was, I, it was, I, this isn't not an emotional scene in a phone booth, but, but it's, it's the phone booths, plural scene that okay. makes me hate the cell phone as a movie device. It's, <laughs> right. it's, it's yeah. dirty. Harry. Ruined movies, didn't it? Dirty Harry. <laughs> dirty Harry. It's the scene where the, the, somebody's buried alive and the guy's going to kill her. And he has to get across San Francisco and answer the cell phones. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh yeah. my God. It's like a ticking time bomb. Oh yeah. my God. It's just, it's like, 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 I guess. You, you, if you, if you had to rewrite it, you would say, um, leave your cell phone behind and there's going to be ringing cell phones planted in all these different places. Or I'll I mean, put a burner somewhere. Yeah. I'll put yeah, like yeah, a, a, a like string of burners right. across I, town. You have to find the phone. Or there's yeah. like, I don't have any, any connection. I can't connect. I have no, no cell service. Yeah. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. It's not nearly as good. <laughs> uh, so that, that, I mean, you know. Like that's a good scene. Uh, also, what about like, like, isn't there a really funny in one of the Superman movies where they had just put up those things that weren't booths? Yeah, he goes to start yeah, yeah. to change, yeah. and he's and oh, it's one of those. That was, that was, that was yeah, so, so, so that's really funny. The modern world of 1975 <laughs> yeah. or whenever it was. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's hilarious. No, that was good. That was like, like, like that was but, in the first Superman movie, I think. Right? Was it? Was yeah. it? Yeah. For, yeah, I think so. <laughs> that's really. I mean, that's like like in the first Daniel Craig James Bond when the bartender goes shake it or stir it and he goes do I look like I give a damn yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, uh, I love when they do that yeah. I know <laughs> so funny so are you working on anything new any any scripts or shows or movies um, or anything I, fun I, 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 my pandemic was spent doing a I, I, I did a novel a couple I, I, oh. I, I mentioned in passing my you know my, my unpleasant uh, Hulu experience and <laughs> I, you know, I, it was a show I loved, and somewhere halfway through the cut of the pilot, they decided that their brand was network TV, where you could say fuck, and oh. we we tended to disagree. So it was a um, because I didn't want to say fuck. <laughs> yes, I don't shouldn't have to say it if I don't want to say it. Um, and so I, I, I was looking for a palate cleanser, mm. and you know, I basically was like, I either want to be the middle relief writer on something I don't care about. Or I want some place <laughs> where, where everybody will leave me alone and let me do what I want. Nice. And I was pitching like drama podcasts and I wound up at Audible and I pitched them something. And it was actually, it, it was based on an old pilot of mine that in the wake of my miniseries, I had given to Steven Spielberg and he said it was the bleakest, most depressing <laughs> thing I've ever read and he didn't want anything to do. <laughs> you know, he was like this sort of badge of honor. And yeah, so, I was gonna say that's kind of cool. Well, I said, well, I've got the script that Steven Spielberg hates. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Ooh, let's take a look. Yeah, so so they, they read it and they were like, well, it's way too complicated to be a podcast. And we ever wanted to write a novel. And, you know, of course, since oh. I was tired of dishwashing and wanted to be a chef. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I wrote this book, which is an Audible only original. And oh. it was read by John Waters, which was really exciting for me. Amazing. Oh, nice. That is amazing. I got, I got to go to Baltimore and watch him record it, and it did well. So I the beginning of the pandemic, they asked me for another one. So that just went off, I guess, a month ago or something like that. Oh, well, what are the titles of these Audibles? Because I have an Audible account. Uh, the John Waters read one is called Junk, and the sequel is called Jive. All right. Yeah. Wow. So I'm working, on a, I'm working on a third one of those. And, oh, nice. um, how know, is that? 
What is that like? You, do you enjoy it? Are oh. you're doing it specifically to be read? Yeah. Right? So yeah. I, I mean, I learned stuff from the first one. Like one thing, you know, you don't do in prose a lot is after a while you stop saying, Kathy said, you know? right, 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 <laughs> right? right. Like just right. like, like, and I realized there was this point where you had to do it a little bit more because when there's a stretch of dialogue, yeah. Yeah. Unless oh, you've yeah. got somebody who's really doing, you know, Orson Welles level voices, like you have to remind oh, yeah. every so often. No, yeah. like, I mean, so there were like, you know, I, I kind of because 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 I come out of the short direct sentences school of prose, like, yeah. like <laughs> my stuff seems pretty easy to read coherently. Like it, you know, it's it's not like trying to listen to Faulkner, um, <laughs> but it, it, um, it. So I learned some. I learned some tricks. It was great. I mean, they let me do whatever I want. Then they give me an editor who has great notes. So, you know, when, when somebody gives you a good idea, it makes you feel good because you don't feel like an asshole who just keeps shooting down ideas. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I spent a year being the asshole who shot down every idea. And I was like, God, is it, is it me? Or <laughs> yeah. these ideas suck. And you know, it's, there, there's no parallel universe where they'll make the movie your way and you can see whether it did just as well. Oh my God. Yeah. There, I just bought junk and they gave me Jive <laughs> well, with it as a bonus. Whoa! Hey, that's that's yes. that's like there we are. So I can't wow. wait to listen to it. I, I love I love audiobooks. I probably have a code somewhere I could have sent you. Kevin, so. I, I bought it. No man, I'll give it to you. I, well, I bought. I got my credit. Oh. <laughs> you know, audible credits. <laughs> but you get credit. Oh, I'm excited. That's well, really I've cool. consumed like the next like like at least 150 hours of all of your life stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> With all these recommendations, so it sounds like it. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I know yeah. we're gonna definitely have to do podcasts about all of these. It was great. It's been so well, fun talking but, to you. There's so I feel like we need to do another podcast just to talk more about stuff. So we didn't talk about Spielberg, what that was like. We haven't. I want to I ask mean, one more thing. Okay. It sounds like you're wrapping it up, Kathy. Am I? Oh, it well, it's an hour. Like, we told him it would be an hour. <laughs> oh. I feel like I, I mean, I, I feel like I just babbled endlessly. So. We no, love babbling. No, no, really well, good. what else are you going to do? You're not going to do like an interpretive mime or something. You have to talk on a podcast. <laughs> that's what you did. <laughs> I, I, and that's I, excellent. It's we like having you, you on because we think you should mention my interpretive mind. <laughs> you know, it, this is my favorite onion, onion headline ever was when Marcel Marceau died and the headline was Marcel Marceau trapped in box he can't get out of. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's good. I know. It's really good. <laughs> that should be a movie. Yeah. You could just retire. If, if, if you made that one up. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So oh my God, that's amazing. Well, I, I was, it. I was just going to add the, 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 presence of music in your life is still a thing i imagine right it is you, you play your guitar yeah. every day probably i do and i i actually um i i put out an album three years ago available on all the platforms it's called ah. move to, it's called move to duarte and, okay let me go find it oh, it's wow. a double album on account of you know it's my first solo album after 40 years so I figured wow it. um yeah I, I i i hadn't you know, I, I play the guitar all the time, but I, you know, I, I, when I started writing, I could finally afford better guitars. And I was looking yeah. at, this, you know, a, a, a nice Gibson. This mm. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh, Burke loves this stuff. It's a sweet one. Yeah. I was like, Got a little you know, poly tuner want, on the top there. I think. Yeah. And I was like, all yeah. I want to do before I die is learn how to play one Mississippi John Hurt song. I want to learn how to finger pick because I could never move my thumb independent of my fingers. And yeah. you know, before yeah. they before they get completely arthritic, I thought that would be. Cool. <laughs> and so I, I I still can't do that, obviously. But I learned a couple of things, and then um, I wrote a song about Bruce Springsteen dyeing his hair because that was an issue. <laughs> uh, I think there's a video of that out yeah. there on YouTube. That is just right? catty. Uh, <laughs> a little bit, but you know, I mean, he's a working man. You know? <laughs> and that was before he was charging you know, $1,800 for, to see him on Broadway or doing, um, Jeep right. Cherokee ads. Right. That guy. Yeah, the Jeep Cherokee ads. I mean, you know, did, yeah. did he change? Like, does it go, you know, at night we sweat it out on the streets of a runaway American dream at night we ride through mansions of glory in our new Jeep Cherokee. I mean, wait, <laughs> <laughs> and the man's oh, worth a billion dollars. He doesn't yes. have to do that. He's worth a billion yeah. dollars. Yeah. But he still yeah. wants the, the, the adoration. He still wants the, yeah, how do you get the, I, well, I get the Broadway's adoration, but, the Jeep Cherokee ad is like, you know. It was probably so easy. Like, here, we'll have you for an hour. Yeah. An hour of your day, we're going to pay you $5 billion. Yeah, yeah. okay, I'll do it. He's probably <laughs> got a good friend that owns Jeep. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, you know. When... <laughs> yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> sure, sure, <laughs> <that> image, <right? laughs> 
It's so true. I know it seems like Stringsy wouldn't sell out for something like that, but he did. Uh, yes, he has. <laughs> At least it's a Jeep. You know, it seems kind of rugged and cool. It wasn't like he was driving a, you know, a little dinky oh. car or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, if he did a Krispy Kreme ad. It or fits his brand. <laughs> Yeah, Something really that, that, that would be kind of, you know, good point. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so that, and um, there was I was working with with some movie people who had this. You know, everything is is damaged by all those sort of Robert McKee screenwriting books, you know, and everything oh, else. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, Shakespeare was five acts, but they neglect right. that. So, right. <laughs> these guys were four acts, and they made this thing that looked like a baseball diamond. You know, so yeah. and and so in the middle where the pitcher's mound would be. You know, you put these big points up at first base, second base, third base hole. But uh, <laughs> where the pitcher's mound would be was the moral premise. And this is some guy's screenwriting something or other. Yeah. Uh, and sure. the moral premise was the theme of your movie. But it was things like, you know, you would say to them, crime does not pay. And they'd go, crime does not pay. As if they'd never heard anything so brilliant. And all of a sudden, everything was okay. And so I wrote a song called The Moral Premise about how angry I was. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Love oh, my God. That's so good. Pretty soon there were a bunch of songs and there's the album. So. What's the name of the album? Moved to Duarte. Moved to okay. Duarte. Okay. Okay. I think Available I saw that on Spotify. Spotify. Oh. Yeah, I think I just oh. saw it. it it's there. <laughs> okay. Definitely. So Amy, you might as well get some listens, right? Not yeah. Pay. <laughs> <laughs> my crime does not pay <laughs> i heard because um, i was thinking about committing some crimes and i just i don't know you want it to pay though yeah. Yeah. it's gotta yeah. pay though yeah. hey and yeah. that album cover is cool what is the story behind that album cover oh a friend of mine mike roy is a painting of his and i just really liked it so oh that's like, not you though no. <laughs> you with not. the bow on your head that's not you <laughs> can, I, can i can i use your painting can you say um, <laughs> that's awesome yeah, I heard once that um, Julius Epstein, you know, who wrote Casablanca with his brother, yeah. um, they they didn't I don't they didn't call it the moral premise, and I guess they asked for a theme, and he said, just tell them no man is an island; it works for everything. And in fact, <laughs> the scary thing is, it does. <laughs> yeah, <It's> so, that's <laughs> wise words to all you you know screenwriters out there. Just pitch yeah. that idea. No man is an <laughs> but no it's, man's that, island. it's that you know that film noir thing i love that's an that's a thing i'm sort of obsessed with as the old uh, 40s crime dramas los, oh, yeah. set in los angeles you know yeah. preferably but the idea a lot of so many of those is not only does crime not pay but crime is addicting and really seductive and i and i always love the 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 idea that it's so compelling just one more, just one more job, yeah. you know, that idea. Yeah, one more job. And then I'll stop, right. you know, because I'm going to this, this far. This one's going <laughs> to be the big one, and then I can yeah. retire, you yeah, know. And then I can stop. This will be the last <laughs> thing I steal. Yeah. Never, yeah. never is. <laughs> and that, I mean, isn't that, isn't that, I mean, isn't that like all the way through Baby Driver? I mean, isn't that like just, a, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Baby yeah. Driver. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, that was so funny. Ugh. So this has been awesome. And yeah. you've taken an hour awesome over me. an hour of your time. I know. It's like so fun. I feel we can keep going, but you know, I know you have things to do. Well, <laughs> well we can we, we could if you would love to have you on come again, back sure. and be on the show again, we can talk we can actually watch some of the stuff that you told us about and then you can yeah. come back and we'll talk about it. We'll watch okay. Jerry Haji and then say, Okay, here we go. Fine. <laughs> Let's do I'll, it. Give me an excuse to watch it yeah. for a third time. So. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That'll be super fun. Yeah. yeah. It's been so fun. I loved hearing the stories. That's great. Because yes. you don't hear about that stuff much. So I love it. It was, fa it was fascinating stuff, Les. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having on. me. Yeah. Okay. Don't go anywhere. We're going to sign off with our little, you know, sign I'm off going, song. I'm going song. Right here. And okay. then we'll just say bye bye after. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, We'll talk about the uh, the fees and everything like that after we come, you know, after we. Yeah. You, never, you never did that mime thing you said he was going to do. <laughs> yeah, we're, gonna... we're not going to show that to our viewers. That's going to be a private show. <laughs> Less is in a box he can't get out of. He can't get out. All right. All right. See everybody next. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks for joining Thank us. Next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>